Good morning. Welcome to St. James United Methodist Church. Uh, we're so glad that you're here in person with us. And for the people who are not that you might know who watch us online, our live stream is down again. So since the third time is apparently the third strike, we're going to call Comcast this week and get it figured out. Kyle has been working so hard to try to get it to work and it's just not cooperating. So. It's good to be with you here in person. We are, however, recording the service, so folks will be able to watch it later, just not live. But we're working on it. As we draw our series about do unto others and the golden rule to a close, we may feel more or less resolved in our openness to each other and to folks who disagree with us. Loving our neighbors, including relatives and co-workers, acquaintances and strangers as ourselves, is no simple task. We need God. We need the love of God to show us mercy and strength to love as God loves. We need the story of Jesus, the one who loved across the lines that had been drawn in society, of his day, but who also stood up for the least and the lost. We need faith that no matter the strain of differing positions, policies, and politics, that we will move forward in love. Disagreeing need not be antithetical to love and grace, and indeed our world depends on all of us working for a better world filled with more kindness more compassion, more humility, more respect, and of course, more love. of simply coming together is revolutionary, which in its earliest form meant finding a course around a central point. We gather today around the light of Christ as the center and guiding light of our lives. This becomes our point of reference for our relationships and for our love in the world. This today is our love revolution. Let us pray. Loving and hope-filled God, we ask you to stay close in our lives as we move into an unknown future. Wrap us in your love and invite us to go and do likewise, to do unto others in ways that build up your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the center that holds, and in the power of the Spirit that transforms. Amen. Let us sing together, Christ has broken down the wall, the second and third verse, which are printed in your bulletin.
Good morning, my name is Noreen Hoisington and I will be your scripture reader today. It's been an eye-opening experience to be here. In the end, I'm still not sure I'm capable of moving closer. What if that never happens? What if the chasm gets wider? But I have begun to imagine a way to live together. I know we both are still afraid, but I wish you no harm. Wait. Let us imagine this kind of outcome. Breathe again. We are not alone. Christ is with us. Let us take a deep breath together. The rhythm of our breath and heartbeat is the same. Our desire for life and love is the same. Our desire for a peace in which we flourish is the same. Let this moment permeate our souls and let us pass the peace of Christ between us. This peace is meant for all people. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please now greet one another with the peace of Christ. like to invite any children here this morning to join me down front. Good morning. I see one coming. Oh, and a friend. <laughs> Is Max, my buddy, coming? Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> hey, bud. And happy birthday, right? When yep. it? Yeah. And happy birthday. How are you one years old? I can't believe it. <laughs> and good morning, Mackenzie. Who's your other friend you brought today? Avery. Avery the alien? Or is he a monster? Alien. Alien, I love it. So this morning, we are going to hear a story from the Bible later. And I think you'll be talking. Miss Carol's doing Sunday school today because Miss Robin is away. And we're going to be hearing a story about Jesus 
who, I don't know if you know this, but so Jesus was Jewish. He practiced the Jewish faith, yeah. And he was a teacher. So he was kind of like their version of a pastor, which is called a rabbi. And so he was a leader. And Jesus was going around and he was helping people, right? And he was loving people and he was healing people and he was being kind to people, even people that other people didn't want to be kind to. And unfortunately, this got Jesus in a lot of trouble, which seems so silly because he was doing good things. So why was he getting in trouble? Well, the leaders of his church, his temple, started to feel like other people thought Jesus was the best, and they were starting to get worried because they wanted to be the best. And so they decided to trick Jesus, okay? And they asked Jesus some what they thought were really hard questions. Yeah, and one of those questions was, Hey, Jesus, what is the most important commandment or rule? So what do you think? What's the most important rule that God would have for us? What do you think? The mo above all the other rules, what is the number one most important? Do you have any ideas? I know you just want to see what's in my bag, I promise. I don't know if you can have it yet, but I promise you will see. What do you think? If you had to do any rule... What would be the number one most important? I'm hearing some ideas. Do you need some help? Okay, what, is a, what does the congregation think? <gasps> I hear love God and love one another. You're both right. That's okay. Jesus, do you see my cows on there? Yeah. Jesus says the most important thing is to love God with all your heart and your mind and your strength and to love your neighbor, other people, as yourself. And all the other rules kind of fall under, the, under that. So all the other rules are good too, but most important, if you can remember anything, remember to love God and love your neighbor. And so even though the other teachers tried to trick Jesus, Jesus kind of had the right answer. And today I decided even though it's Halloween week, I'm not going to trick you. I'm going to give you a treat. How about that? All right. So I have a treat here for you, and you can take a few. Since you were so smart this morning, I have some smarties for you. And since Daddy did such a good job, he gets some treats too, and maybe you can give, share one with Mommy, okay? You can have sugar today because you're one. Oh, your first treat. Look at that. All right. Let's say a quick prayer today. God, thank you so much for loving us and for giving us the most important rule to love you, God, and to love other people. Help us do that so that everyone can feel your love and not get tricked, but instead have the treat that is your love, the sweetest love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, and you can follow. Miss Carol's going to go to Sunday school, and Max, you get to hang out with us today, but pretty soon. Before you know it, you'll be in Sunday school. Don't want to rush it.
This morning's scripture reading is from Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. Jesus names us many times in scripture as neighbors to one another. We've been depending on his vision for the neighborliness of humanity as we navigate our own search for good news. Together we will continue to find ways to tell deeply good news for all people by filtering filtering our interactions through the lens of love. Today's scripture reminds us that interpretation of the law has always been difficult for humanity. We have never been one of one mind, but as we have heard in this series, what we put into the world is part of the ongoing creation of the world. Is it possible to put love out there as always the first impulse for interpretation? Hear these words from Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the laws is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. One of these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. A word of God for our times. Let us pray. Loving and holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as we wrap up our series on the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, we have hopefully learned a lot. We started out by talking about the importance of choosing kindness and that it's a choice that we must make even, and maybe especially, as Jesus says and teaches us, for people that we don't like or who we might define as our enemies. And we had this summary from a pastor named Rob sum it up like this. It's easy to love the people you like. It is much harder to love the jerks. But I'm telling you to love the jerks, says Jesus. And then he adds this, the pastor adds this on at the end, because there was a time that you were a jerk and someone loved you. And then we talked a lot about compassion and how compassion is a tool that's in our spiritual toolbox. And as Albert Einstein said, it's a technology that kind of is above and more important than all other technologies as even it stands the test of time. And it will always be an important technology and tool for us to use because our world is in desperate need of compassion and love. And then we talked about humility and how we heard from Paul's letter to the Ephesians that God lays out this path for us. God lays the road ahead of us, which is great and good news for us. We don't have to figure it out. God's laying it out. But we do have to then walk that road. It's a two-way street. We have to walk that road with humility and gentleness and patience. And we were reminded that humility helps us move beyond the surface level and see people as ultimately God's beloved children created in the image of God. And then last week we talked about the one, another way to live out the golden rule is to use respect. And that everyone, everyone, yes, even that guy, yes, even me, yes, even you, is worthy of respect. And we kind of edited the golden rule a little bit and we said maybe when we think about it in the lens of respect, it's also about treating others not how you personally would want to be treated, because everyone's different, but maybe it's also about treating others the way they have asked or want to be treated and 
going deeper to build that relationship and finding out how others want you to treat them. And then this week we end with the greatest of all, which is love. And as you heard Noreen read in our scripture from Matthew this morning, we have a little bit of a dilemma, but it's also a scripture that is greatly quoted. And you guys were awesome helping Mackenzie out. Remember what the greatest commandment is, which is love God and love your neighbor. Jesus, in this scene, a Jewish rabbi, is being tested by the Pharisees, who are also Jewish religious teachers and leaders. And in order to test Jesus, to trick him, maybe, maybe, one of them steps forward, a lawyer, an expert in the law, to ask Jesus a question. And they ask, what is the greatest commandment? And before we get to Jesus' answer, I want to just give us a context of where we are at and why this lawyer is asking this question at this point and why it matters. If we look at the rest of chapter 22, this comes at the end. This is not Jesus' first test. In, in fact, it is the third of four tests from the religious leaders at the time. The first one comes toward the beginning of the chapter where Jesus enters the temple and sees all the money changers and tax collectors in the temple and gambling on the, the offerings and the collections that has been brought to the temple and he gets angry because they're exploiting people and so he th tosses the table over, you might know that one, um, and then the Sadducees, the scribes show up and they're like, hey, why are you doing this? Are you against the government? Trying to kind of catch Jesus. And Jesus says the famous line, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. No, if the government is asking for taxes, pay those taxes, follow the law, right? But what that wasn't why Jesus turned the, or flipped the tables. Jesus flipped them because, not because people were paying the government, but because they were then collecting some money and putting it in their own pockets at the expense of others. And then the second test or trick happens after that. And a bunch of Sadducees, religious leaders, come up to Jesus and try to catch him again. And they challenge Jesus on the concept of resurrection because there were different um, sects within Judaism that believed different things about resurrection, and they pose this hypothetical rhetorical trap for Jesus. And they say this story about, well, what if I died and I had this wife, and then, you know, my brother marries her, and then he dies, and so the next brother marries her because that was kind of the law of how it went and on and on and on, and so now we get to heaven, right? And the resurrection, whose husband is she? Whose husband is she? Hmm, interesting. But again, Jesus sees that it's a trap being laid out for him, and he kind of speaks to the bigger picture of the promise of resurrection and eternal life, and kind of just ignores their kind of trick question in there. And then we get to this question, the third time they're testing him and ask what the greatest commandment is. So that's kind of what happened in the text. Now let's set the scene once again and what is going on in Jesus' life during this time because that matters too. It's Holy Week when this passage comes up, or what we know as Holy Week. Palm Sunday, the big procession and parade with Jesus on the donkey and people yelling Hosanna as he goes into Jerusalem has just happened. And it's Monday. <laughs> and Jesus is having a heck of a Monday if this is his Monday as he's getting all these questions. And we know that eventually Friday comes, right, when Jesus is killed. So this is just kind of in the air, this tension these trials that are coming to Jesus. One commentary says, it's the Monday of Holy Week. 
Jesus lives and teaches in the tension between Sunday's acclamation and Friday's execution. He has faced the opposition of religious leaders throughout his ministry, and that opposition only grows stronger in the first part of this chapter. Yet, Jesus takes the pastoral risk of hearing the lawyer's question out and answering it in good faith. So, Jesus is in the midst of test number three, which is happening, by the way, in public, because the leaders at the time are trying to catch Jesus and have witnesses around, and it's the stress and tension of Holy Week. So this is the heaviness that Jesus is feeling as he answers this question. And the reason I set all of that up is because we are doing this series and talking today in the midst of an intense tension leading up to election day in an intense political climate. And we are being asked the question, who do we vote for? And what is that all going to mean? And we have this heaviness of these tension and sides and polarization and all the things we've talked about in the air. It's the elephant in the room that's also a donkey, right? Both political parties. And so that is the tension for us as we hear this passage today, but it's also the tension for Jesus, the Holy Week, the political upheaval, the government upheaval, the religious upheaval, as he is being tested and asked these questions. But as the commentary says, Jesus does take the pastoral risk of hearing out the lawyer who asks this question, and Jesus doesn't meet him, you know, with anger or with hatred or with disrespect, but listens and then answers in good faith. And Jesus' response, of course, to the lawyer is the simple answer, simple, (laughs) in, in that it's short, love God and love your neighbor. And Jesus knows what he's doing here. He's smart. He would get one of my smarties this morning because what he does is he knows exactly why the Pharisees are asking him this. He knows they're trying to catch him. They've already tried to twice. And so he answers them with the same respect and intellect that they are expecting him to answer with. And so he quotes the Jewish shema that they would know. The the rule that is said at the beginning of services in the Jewish faith, the rule that is written on a scroll and hung before families' doorways still to this day, that says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That is foundational. And so he quotes the Torah in saying that, the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 5. And he doesn't stop there, right? Because Jesus knows what's happening. And so he adds another scripture also that they would know. He adds a quote from Leviticus 19, verse 18. And he says, there's another scripture that is like the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, all the other laws and the prophets can be hung on these two things. And if you look at the Ten Commandments that they're trying to catch Jesus up on by saying, oh, pick one of the ten, which one's the best? And you know there's a, there might not be a right answer, but there's definitely a wrong answer. But Jesus knows that if you put all the Ten Commandments out, The love God and love neighbor can kind of categorize all of them. So the first four commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or idol, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Those are all ways that you can love God. Love God, don't have any other gods, 
don't make any idols, don't take the name of God in vain, and respect the Sabbath. Love God. And then the last six can come under the title of love neighbor. Honor thy mother and thy father. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And thou shalt not covet. All of those are ways that you can love your neighbor. And when Jesus gives this answer, he's also not radically different than other rabbis who have come before him. In fact, Rabbi Hillel, who died six years before he was born, said when he was challenged by a Gentile, a non-Jew, to repeat the entire Torah on, while standing on one foot, so, of course, they were trying to catch him, too, right? How can you repeat the entire Torah while standing on one foot? So that rabbi, who came six years before Jesus, said, What is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah. The rest is the explanation. Go and learn. What is hateful to you, don't do that to other people. The rest of the Torah explains why. So go and learn. And so Jesus, knowing his audience and knowing his questioners, he kind of then puts a period on the end of his answer by saying, on these two commandments, love God, love neighbor, hang all the law and the prophets. Love God and love neighbor is like a branch of a tree or like a door hinge that the rest of the laws and the teachings from the prophets hang on. Or to put it another way, all the other laws and religious teachings must be filtered through the lens of love God and love your neighbor. Those things come first. Everything else is gravy, as they say. Another commentary says, in quoting the Shema, Jesus points out that the aim of the law is to orient one's entire life toward God. However, one cannot love God without loving what God loves or who God loves. One cannot love God and oppress or exclude any of God's creatures, even one's enemies. And while the scribes and Pharisees used the law in some ways, to place severe limits on those whom they were obliged to recognize as their neighbors, Jesus joins these texts together in order to smash all the limits and boundaries of neighborliness. This all comes back to what we've been talking about over the last month in our series. Kindness, compassion, humility, respect, and love. We may disagree. We may vote differently. We may have different stances on different political issues. And at the end of the day, or I should really say at the beginning of the day, are we living out what Jesus names as the greatest commandment? Love God and love neighbor. Reverend Ben Hensley puts it this way, when we are wondering what the point of being Christian is, we can look to this passage. Love God, love your neighbor. When we are wondering how on earth we should approach this election season in 2024 with its astonishing complexity and historical firsts, we can look to this passage as well. Love God, love your neighbor. And as your pastor, I cannot and will not tell you who to vote for. But what I will say is that when you go to the ballot booth next week or when you fill out your absentee mail-in ballot, ask yourself, am I loving God with this vote? Am I loving my neighbor with this vote? And I know it's not a perfect system. Humans are not perfect. Candidates are not perfect. Systems are not perfect. And as I tell Finn many times, and he gets annoyed with me, you have to work with what you've got. So vote, vote first of all, 
and vote your conscience and vote in a way that loves God and loves your neighbor to the best of your ability by working with what you've got. And then, because we're not done once we vote next Tuesday, there's still going to be work to do, and then act. Act with kindness, act with compassion, act with humility, act with respect, act with love. Live your life in ways that love God and love your neighbor. The rest is gravy. And for Jesus, this test with the Pharisees did not end well. We know the story, right? We know this was Monday of Holy Week, and it just goes downhill from there. Even after he gives his response of love God and love neighbor, he ends up being executed brutally. But even then, the story doesn't end there. Because not only does Jesus come back to life through the power of the resurrection, showing that death did not have the final say, love did. But it doesn't end there, does it? Because then his disciples, although they were scared and hid for a while, they're human, they have anxieties just like us, they then continued Jesus' teaching. And then the people after them did, and the people after them did. And fast forward 2,000 years later, and here we are talking about loving God and loving neighbor. Here we are as the body of Christ, the church, living out actions of love in our community. Because regardless of which way the election goes, we still have good and holy work to do, maybe even more so. We still have the power to make choices in our individual and communal lives to love God and to love neighbor. And as Reverend Hensley says it, no matter what happens in the coming election and whether our side wins or loses, we can recognize as Christians that those results matter far less than whether or not we are living into the greatest commandments of Jesus. So may we do unto others with kindness and compassion and humility and respect and love, remembering that the greatest of these is love. And ultimately, through the power of God in Christ, love always, 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 eventually wins. So may we help it along. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we continue to worship and love God this morning, I invite you to turn into the red hymnal, page 402. We'll sing verses 1 and 2, Lord, I want to be a Christian. And again, if you're comfortable standing, stand. If you're more comfortable sitting, sit. Totally up to you. But let's sing together.
choir can help us. So we're just going to do verses one and two. Lord, I want to be a This morning as we prepare to celebrate all that God has given us and then celebrate that we too can be generous by giving those gifts back to help make a bigger impact in our community and our world, I do have one exciting announcement I know some of you have been waiting for, which is how did we do at the Harvest Fair last week? And I have to say, wow, Thank you. When Brenda and Leslie told me I did what Finn did, not only a th one thumbs up, not a two thumbs up, but a 10, and then he'll put his toes up, 20 up, we made $9,775. So thank you, everybody. Amazing. God is so good. And we have some more in coming in, so um, we'll have a little more after that as well. But thank you. I know we said it last week, but we can't say it enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you, not only to Leslie and Brenda, who do such a wonderful job getting us all organized, but to also everyone who volunteered and showed up and bought things um, and just made it such a wonderful day. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. And now we will collect our financial offering this morning. Thank you for continuing to give so that we can bring God's love into the world in tangible ways. So thank you for your financial offering. The ushers will collect that as we hear a musical gift from the choir. Mm -hmm.
generous God, we give you thanks for all the ways that you have blessed us. And we thank you for inspiring us to be generous with our giving so that all may feel your love. In this way, not only do we love you, but we also love our neighbor. So bless these gifts that they may be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Is there anything on the clipboard back there? I don't see anything here. Is there one back there? That has anything? Okay. Okay. This morning, um, as we enter into a time of prayer for one another and loving one another, um, I do have one thing that the choir through their anthem reminded me. Um, this Friday is what's officially known as All Saints Day. Um, so we will be celebrating all of our saints this coming Sunday on the 3rd. And the way that you can do that and participate in that is, um, we did this last year if you were here. You, if you would like to bring a small like framed photograph or other memory token, we'll kind of create a saint's altar of all of the saints that we would like to remember in our lives. And so um, if you don't know, the way that we talk about saints, because it's similar but different in the Catholic Church, and you might know that tradition, is anyone that has inspired you um, in your faith journey or has been loving to you um, that you would like to remember. They can be living or dead. They can be a relative. They don't have to be a relative either, just someone that was inspiring to you. If you would like to bring in a picture or a small token and we'll add it to our altar and make an altar of saints and we'll, when we have communion next Sunday together, there will also be time that we will lift names of saints that you would like to remember next week. So um, please bring something in and we'll create a beautiful altar um, as we remember our saints. And now at this time, we would love to hear any joys or concerns, ways that we can be in prayer with you, not only today, but also through the week. So if you have a joy or concern, please raise your hand and um, Dave will bring the microphone over to you. As some of you may know, my brother passed away on Wednesday, so I'll be traveling down to Binghamton. It's five and a half hours, so pray for traveling mercies, as well as his family. And also, uh, prayers for my son, Rick. He's having a hard time. Hmm. Last Sunday, uh, the, um, uh, one of our sister churches in Manchester, the uh, first United Methodist Church, had a, um, a great rally, it was a youth rally, uh, but there were a lot of adults there too, I have to say. About 30 or 35 people put together 100 um, flood buckets. And it was an amazing thing that to see uh, that many people make 100 flood buckets in 15 minutes, it was awesome. And some of those flood buckets made it back here uh, to our church as well. And they're trying to keep some of these flood buckets local they don't have to go to a hub any place so that they don't have to be transported once again when they're needed. So we're looking to keep some of these locally uh, according to uh, our new plan. So it was, a great, it was a great event. I just want to um, say prayers for us because we're moving on Friday and we need mm -hmm. lots and lots and lots of prayers. <laughs> lots and lots and lots of unpacking. And um, like I said, lots and lots and lots of prayers. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> so I just wanted to um, say that tomorrow is my husband's birthday. Not only is it his birthday, but my husband and I have been struggling with infertility and recurrent pregnancy loss over the last year. And I'm also having a procedure tomorrow to hopefully find some answers. So it's a, both a joy and a concern. Thank you. Well, even though the tech issues still continue, it doesn't really matter because for those of you who know my brother Ryan, um, we heard that last night he proposed to his girlfriend Yay. Caroline and she said yes. So we're all happy and excited for them. So, yeah. 
<laughs> Your mom's prayers were answered for sure. She's yes. been so worried. Yay, I'm so happy. <laughs> Good morning. I think lots of you know it, but uh, today, Yay. Max is one year old. Yay, and Max! <laughs> Happy birthday! We're gonna go to lunch with all of us here and Max's other grandparents, and we're going to have cake. Woo! Look. Yay! So fun. Other prayers. I see some in the choir. Here, but, the choir is mics, yeah, technically. Yeah. We're mic'd yeah. anyway. But, uh, <laughs> the neighbors across the street, Gilbert Crossing, are having their second annual trunk or treat this Tuesday evening, and it's in the bulletin that they want to make sure that those uh, who are young among us and those who have kids, grandkids, great grands, that they want to come and enjoy the trunk or treat. Take note of the time in the bulletin, and uh, just great that our neighbors across the way invited us. Awesome. And there's also a trunk or treat at the library this afternoon. We're not doing one because we didn't want to compete with those two. We wanted to partner, so awesome. Uh, on a happier note, we have a new fireman in our midst. He's just <gasps> graduated from fire school. Is that what you call it? Nick, <laughs> Nick, we're very happy for you. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Nick's like, I'm never coming back. Stop. <laughs> Um, I did also, I w we were late getting in and getting worship started this morning because the choir was praying. Um, we just want to lift up continued prayers for Amy, who's still hospitalized. And also we heard um, Pastor Bob Stewart, who had retired from St. Paul's UMC here in Manchester. He now serves in Portsmouth. He had a fall and broke several ribs and hit his head. And so we just pray um, that he continues to heal and is doing okay. So we pray for Pastor Bob as well. Anyone else? That's what happens when you put your Christmas lights up this early. Oh no, that's, oh. oh. All right, and then just um, thank you. You had been praying for my sister who had knee surgery. Um, she is doing okay, obviously they, weren't able to fully restore her knee, but um, she's doing better. Although um, her husband has a huge Halloween inflatables display, like 200 inflatables, and she went out to help him this weekend and fell on her knees. So just, she's okay. I saw her yesterday, but she's hurting. So prayers that she stops being so kind and helping people and actually takes care of herself. Um, and so just continued prayers for her and their family as she heals. All right, let us be in the spirit of prayer together. God, thank you so much for this beautiful congregation and the way that we celebrate one another and lift one another up and the ways that we laugh together and also the ways that we support each other when someone is hurting or someone we know is hurting. We pray for all those who need healing and support this week. We give thanks for everyone celebrating birthdays and engagements and graduations. We pray for those who are experiencing loneliness and anxiety and we pray for our country and people working the polls and everyone going out to vote that, that there can be safety and calm in the midst of a very tense time and help us be part of that calm and that love when we show up to vote. God, we ask that you continue to surround all of those countries experiencing war and violence and places with natural disaster that are continuing to have to clean up. And God, just fill us with your love and your peace. We pray all of these prayers, spoken and unspoken, in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we were praying, I remembered someone else, um, the Mithafer family. Um, we know that Randy passed a couple weeks ago. Um, we, I just met with them this last week, and we have a combined um, celebration of life service for Randy and his wife, Kathy, who had passed in March earlier this year. That will be on Saturday, November 16th, here at 11 a.m. Um, and they're going to have a reception at a restaurant after. I don't know the details yet, but um, the funeral serve, the celebration of life, they don't want it to be a funeral. They really want it to be celebrating their mom and dad. That'll be here on Saturday, November 16th at 11 a.m. All right. Before I close us, just two other quick things. We're going to stay behind here. Um, the trustees have an important update. It should take 10, 15 minutes max. We also have church conference booklets available um, for you. That's our yearly meeting to celebrate the ministries and life of the church, which will be taking place next Sunday at noon at Main Street in Nashua. Um, I believe there's a sign up outside the office, especially if you want a carpool. It might be good to coordinate because they have downtown parking. So that's a little tricky. And following the church conference next Sunday at noon is the crop walk. And if you would like to walk or participate, um, you can contact the office for information um, to do that. And that's right in Nashua, so it'll be really easy to get to if you would like to participate in that. All right, that's everything. So now, oh, Dave has one more, sorry. Oh, thank you. So we'll have that and we'll enjoy it's Pastor's Appreciation Month. Thank you. And we'll um, have cake in fellowship after our quick, brief meeting. All right. Oh, we have one more hymn. Oh, my goodness. It is late. Let's, what we're going to do is all, instead of, we're going to skip that hymn. Let's have a blessing because then we're going to have a combined postlude to, that will sing with the choir. The words are in your bulletin. It's the final verse to kind of our theme song, Christ Has Broken Down the Wall. And we'll sing it together because it's about how we're going to take action in helping Christ break down walls that prevent people from loving one another. But first, hear this blessing. May the Holy One show you the way to do unto others with love. May the Christ, whose light is the center of all that is, ground you in the assurance that no one is outside of love. May the Spirit show forth through you an extraordinary act you never imagined you had the power to achieve. And may you know the peace that surpasses all understanding, especially when it's difficult to understand. And all God's people said together, Amen. Let us now sing together. Christ has broken down the wall. The last verse, we will tear down the walls. Thank you. 